You want to look at the one that scared me, Kevin, to death? Yes. That's a, that, that answers, that's a yes. Why is there a gaping hole here, Brandon? What's the story behind this? This was the lot that had the McDonald's drive through window where they were selling drugs at the first My month. My goodness. They got to the point they didn't care. If you pay 300 bucks a month, you can murder somebody at the park. This is the very first RV park that I purchased. And after three years of owning it, I have still taken zero dollars from this property. I've actually put all the money that the property makes back into improving the property and raising the rents. Now, in today's video, we're gonna be talking with Brandon. He is Investment Joy on YouTube. We're gonna be talking about how we flew out to, where is Columbus, Ohio? Do we know, that? where is Ohio? We went to Columbus, Ohio, and we hung out with Brandon, and we visited an RV park that he's actually dumping and getting rid of. It has so many problems. I'm gonna tell you right now, this was the most pain I have felt listening to somebody else's real estate story, but it has a good ending, so stay until the end, hear what he's doing and how much money he's losing and how much money he's making on this RV park. It's the first time you'll ever hear somebody losing and hemorrhaging money, but also they figured out how to make money. It's a great video. Thank you, Brandon, for having us come out. Watch the video. Well, when we first came in, there were 10 trailers. So I bought 29 trailers for $200,000. Wow. Packaged up, delivered. On the surface, it was a really good deal. That's a great deal. Well, what happened was they said, we'll let you cherry pick your inventory, Brandon. So I cherry picked the first 20, maybe 15 places. This is one of my nicer-ish ones. Then I'm busy. We're working on getting the sewage plant fixed and there's issues with the trailer park. They start dumping these trailers in. We still got a hornet nest up there so we don't want to get too super close. Oh, okay. That one, <laughs> eh, one to 10 scale, trailer park scale. This is a five. In the middle of the lot, the middle of the group, they start including a bunch of threes. So if my median cost per trailer is 10,000 ish per trailer, and I cherry pick a bunch of 10,000 trailers, I feel like I'm getting a deal on 10,000, they start including trailers that I won't give a thousand bucks for. Right. And I didn't have the oversight. I've got to package up and come to term with the mistakes that I've made at my trailer park. Put it on social media so other people have value from it. They learn from my mistakes. And then see, here's how I got screwed. Well, my cost was $290,000 on packaging trailers up, bringing them down here. But then the average value wasn't 10,000 per trailer, it's really $7,000. So oh, wow. I take immediately a- $80,000. $80,000 hit yeah. on the start. Okay, so we're going through that. My mistake here was to not get a D9 Caterpillar, a dozer, and just doze the whole entire park. I had all the money I needed, but I would have got rid of every single tenant, every single trailer at the start of this trailer park. We have replaced everybody but two tenants here. And it's not that those two tenants still here are bad tenants, but I would have eliminated all my problems. Because when we took this park over, right here at 48, had the McDonald's drive through window where they were selling drugs at the first of the my month. My goodness. And they would make this long line of cars on the first of the month and wrap around here so they could come get their baggie of drugs every month. Wow. It took me uh, six months to get them out of here. The deal was the police would arrest people and the former owner wouldn't care. Like the original owner of the trailer park, they had it for 40 or 50 years. They got to the point they didn't care. If you pay 300 bucks a month, you can murder somebody at the park. The owner just doesn't care. So the problem is from a law enforcement standpoint, you've got an owner, you keep arresting their tenants, they keep letting them move back in. There's no consequence, consequence yeah. for them killing people. So then is the sheriff's department going to come down here only if they absolutely have to. There's stigma even within the law enforcement community they don't want to come down here to the park because it's nightmare as a police officer do you want to come down here and potentially get sniped no heck no no so not only did you pay 290 for the trailers you also paid the gravel around them yeah i paid for the you gravel around them the, the steps yeah. the stairs so then that was another five thousand dollars per trailer for the stairs gravel there's two stairs per unit and then there's an electrical service panel that we have to run wire we have to pay for that as the owner of the park that alone was 750 dollars or so so then now before i start working on the units i'm like at five thousand dollars per lot so I'm at $15,000 per trailer so now I'm that's an extra what, $150,000 yeah, 150K I throw in the park. So now we're at 290 for the trailers, 150 for the lots. I have not started going in and working on these trailers. Pre-coronavirus, we estimated 10K per turnover, two, 29 trailers, $290,000 in rehab. Now you're 20 grand. 25 to 30. Time goes on, eviction moratorium comes in. I can't get rid of my drug dealers and my non-paying tenants. People start breaking their crap. So some of these, it's $5,000 oh, in wow. damage that comes into the trailer. Meanwhile, we're trying to do it. All these things that could go wrong, start going wrong with yeah. it. Meanwhile, we are bringing money in the trailer park. It gets resunk into it. And as of today, I have probably a hair over a million dollars for it. So then we start going to a bunch of PE firms that are on your trailer park. You probably get two letters a month. 
from someone wanting to acquire it. We start calling these places. And the thing is I find with all of them, they want to close in cash. They want to close in two weeks and there's almost no due diligence on it. And I know if there's very minimal due diligence on it, then they don't even know what the park's worth. They've yeah. just got an automated valuation system. Yeah. They're just pumping out letters. They're just pumping out letters and they're coming up with BS pricing. How bad of a one do you want to look at? Let's look at a bad couple. one. You, yeah. you want to look at the one that scared me, Kevin, to death? Yes. That's a, that, that answers, that's a yes. One of the investors that I'm friends with, he said, yo, I've got some private capital partners. They don't care whether it's a park or not. Will you sell us some units? And I said, yeah, you know, we've got 48 permitted slots here at the park. I'll sell it to you tomorrow. And so we came up with a price so that we'll clear, after four years of ownership, we'll clear 10% a year, which not, isn't great, all things considered. But, but you got also, your money out, you made a profit, you learned yeah. lessons, you can share it on your social medias for other people not to make the same mistakes. I think, yeah. you know, that's all great. Yeah, so it's a lot of hard lessons that I've had to learn about how I interact with people, how I deal with people and unfortunately a lot of things about myself but it is what it is all my traditional real estate holdings they've been great everything's tripled in value this has gone up you know 10 percent a year everything else i have has gone up 25 percent a year the investor partner that i have on this park we started talking about an exit on about a year ago and said what would an exit look like and me trying to sell him on the fact of our cash flow numbers and our top line revenue numbers were just bad. I did a very poor estimate on what things would look like without bulldozing the whole entire park and just redoing it all. This is one like where the state of Ohio throws a fit over. Homeless can get in there. There's people that can get up in this trailer and it comes down to me dealing with contractors and managers. Why is there a gaping hole here, Brandon? What's the story behind this? Well, the story is there were children that lived here at the park that were going through the trailers and just destroying stuff. So they would take bricks or rocks or whatever and they'd throw it and they would just destroy the stuff on the trailer. So what's the process to mitigate that? That's the document damage and evict them. Evict the parents that live here that let their kids do this. Because I can put a lien against a trailer, I can take their trailer too. But that's not something with me running the laundromats, the car washes, social media. I can't do that. I have to outsource that to a attorney because this is held in an LLC in the state of Ohio. I cannot personally file the eviction. Attorney does. And it's something that the documentation has to be built up. Camera feeds, statements from neighbors and stuff. Once again, we're going through coronavirus, so the paperwork's almost double. Oh yeah, it's, it was tough. It, yeah. Eviction moratorium. So then we go two years with this crap. Oh my God. Maybe two and a half years of constantly kids destroying stuff. Think about how much money all these landlords lost. I got lucky. I had one bad situation and we were able to evict the lady because she shoved saran wrap down her toilet and she mm. put it on TikTok. And oh, we wow. were able to screen record it and show it to a judge. And we got an emergency eviction on it. Wow. I got really, really lucky. We didn't have any issues like this. We, my loss was a quarter of a million dollars over coronavirus with 140 doors total. It's been a situation where we tried to get them out and we just couldn't. And I had one of my tenants, they sent me a message after they moved out because I told them, I said, the eviction moratorium is ending next week. I said, I am putting you all on the street. Like, I will hire every hillbilly in Southern Ohio to throw your crap out once we win the court case. They sent me this text. Oh, we understand. We're sorry that coronavirus has been hard on you, but you've been such a blessing in our lives. We've been able to save so much money. We can go buy a house now. Oh, oh my God. God. They weren't paying you on purpose. They, they weren't paying me on purpose. They saved $10,000 in rent money so they could go out and buy a house. The other part is, though, is that those same people would typically take the position that, you know, you're the landlord, you deserve it, you've got money, but people don't understand. It's just like a lot of folks, you know, ma and pa landlords, and this well, really kills your business. There's two options for my company. It's either I make money or I just liquidate my whole entire company and right. a PE firm will acquire it. Right. And, and how are they going to be? They're going to raise rents. I only raised rents once between 2013 and 2020. I raise rents on when the tenants move out, but I don't actively raise rents. Well, at least I didn't before. I have to now because it just destroyed my business over coronavirus. So the question is, or the statement that I make with people is if I go bankrupt, how do you think the next landlord is going to treat you? My average tenant that I talk to, even though I, I, I like my tenants, they say, well, I never thought of that. I hmm. never thought that the actions of me- I was just gonna say me, that's not something that will ever go through their mind. Yeah, it will never go through their mind. So They're I used not to- thinking two months in the future. I had this story. I've I've talked about on social media. Her name was Miss Janet. She'd been in the same house since 1979. I bought her place in 2015. She didn't know how long she'd been in the house. She's been in HUD. Her husband was a post office carrier. He died. The deal was she could get HUD for life if your husband works for the federal government. She had two kids, three kids, got on social security and section eight for the rest of her life. Couldn't remember how long she lived in the property. And when I bought it, she said, I hope you're nice. I hope you'll be my last landlord. And I said, Miss Janet, how many landlords have you had since you've lived here? She couldn't even remember how long she'd lived there. And she said, you'll be number seven. So I said, tell me the stories of them. And she said, well, out of seven landlords, I've only had two I liked, but they both went bankrupt really quick. Mm. 
And I said, really? And she said, yeah, Mr. So-and-so was my landlord from 1990 to 1992. He tried to keep up his rent, but his other tenants screwed him and he just went bankrupt real fast. And then I had another landlord around 9-11 and he was nice, but he went bankrupt too. The landlords that I never really liked never went bankrupt. They just sold it when they could make money. And I said, Miss Janet, this is terrible. I'm like, I don't want to be her seventh landlord, number eight to be worse. I want to be able to maintain this property, but I can't maintain the property at no profit. You know, I hold 40 separate rentals in that company. Yeah, but you greedy landlord, you greedy yeah, property it's, owner, don't you have plenty of money? And that's how everybody feels. I'm like, there's certain days I have great money. There's been other days yeah. where we were running evictions, I had no money, I had went out and tapped a home equity line of credit so I could pay my rehab crew so they could stay in jobs. Four months without taking a salary in my, my rental portfolio in any way, shape or form. I'm happy to do that because I know there's light at the end of the tunnel. And if eventually I'll make money in my real estate company. But your average person, I'd say 70%, 80% of your population would never make those kinds of sacrifices. No, they'll that's, just dump it. That's why I love the social media thing. And I talk to people about seller finance. I talk to them about how if you live in the United States, everybody can own real estate. It's not about your background. It, no one cares who your dad was. No one cares who your mom was. No one cares who your last name is. It's who are you and what value are you going to bring to the table? When I talk to people, I, that's what it is. So I want everybody to be a landlord. I want everybody to get in the property game because if you do, then you're going to be the forefront of seeing where the housing crisis is, seeing where the problems yeah. are with things. That's kind of like one of my big goals. Have you already put in the electrical? Yeah, all the electric, generally speaking, is done. You got a good electrical contractor. You haven't found a mobile home contractor. <sighs> that can do it at scale. It's been very difficult. Yeah. And the big thing is it's oversight. It's why I love the manager that I have now in my office. Like I said earlier, she comes from the mall leasing space. And I just don't have a heart to fire people. And her thing is, if they told you they're going to be there on the job at 9 o'clock and they don't show up till 1030, then they're a liar and you should just fire them. And I'm like, I can't do that. And her statement immediately to me is, well, I will. I and it's not, that. I don't have the heart for it, but she's fine with it. And she says, it's your money, Brandon. Let's take care of business. I've been really thankful, really blessed to have somebody like her. With someone like her dealing with a lot of my assets, we could do well with the park, but we're already million dollars in it. Show me a trailer that's in good condition. Think about this, you've now got into contract 1.35. The outfit that's buying this, they have no clue what is- Oh no, they're local. Park. They know exactly what they're getting into. Why do you want my trailer park? Where else in this county can I go out and buy 48 units? Oh, you can't. They tried to buy another park with 250 units and they just could not get it done. Will you get all your money back plus a little bit? Yeah, well, we're into it at one to 1 to 1.1. After all your commissions? Oh, there's no commissions. I didn't list it. Oh, you're direct. You'll walk away with 200 grand. Yeah, it's a little over 200. So this was worth it? Yeah, it definitely wasn't worth plus it on the- you got a million dollar lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. My business partner on this one, uh, my investor, he's not happy at all. Cause he's like, oh, I thought we were gonna do 17.5 cash flow. Well, that's pre coronavirus and before everything went to crap. Yeah. This lot, 14 over here, this is one of the nicer ones. Right not there. 16. Don't take a picture of that. My goodness. Yeah, the kids. Okay, so this is one of the nicer units. This no. here, 14. No. 14. Uh, that one's currently at 675. A 675. 675. Are they a month. renting just the dirt? No, they are renting the whole entire house off of me. The dirt's encapsulated in that cost, so I'm responsible for maintenance and everything. That's it's a traditional. Really that's very low. Yeah. I, in Arizona, you're probably 875 for that, yeah. maybe 900 bucks. The, the problem is, it's like there's all sorts of ways that I could have reapproached this stuff. And one, trailers are very lossy energy wise. So they pay very high utility bills in the winter. Oh, yeah. Tons. If I was to go back into something like this and I wanted to have a cheaper park, I would do section eight and I would package heating bills with the unit. I would never so recommend- you would have gotten the government to cover that. To cover the heating bills. But so what I would smart. have done is I would have gone in, I've you know a couple guys that are in trailers and they can make any one of these trailers here just stupid energy efficient. They strip it down to the studs, they build onto the exterior of it. So you've got an extra layer of exterior shell. They rebuild the outside of it. And it's like any one of these trailers that's a 14 by 50, seven, 800 square feet on the total size of it, you could maintain a heating bill in the winter for less than 50 bucks a month. That's phenomenal. What are their units here? Are they heat pumps? All propane. All propane. All propane. And where are the units though? They're inside the trailers. Oh, inside. Like, they're yeah. in the winter closets? Yeah. Okay, got it. Which was sucky because we should have gone with all electric heat pumps on this, but I was told not by my contractor. My contractor pointed out the company that sold us wiring to run from the meter boxes to every trailer, it's only 100 amp service line. And they told me none of those trailers could ever use 200 amps. And me like an idiot thought, oh yeah, I guess we're going to run off gas. So, so Will you end up rolling your $200,000 into another project? So you don't oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we've already got three projects lined up. And we're selling this to the guy. They're buying it on like a 10 cap. And we're just going to roll that money over. I've got several apartment complexes I can buy at 16 right now. People feel that there aren't deals out there, but there's, so many deals. there's, there's deals everywhere. The thing is, the people that are looking for a deal one hour a month, 
yeah. are <laughs> the ones that are saying there's no, there's no deals. deals. Yeah. Yeah. The people are looking for a deal an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon are like, I have too many deals. Guys I, like you, guys like me, guys like you, we don't have enough time for the deals. That's the problem. My problem is it's like, I haven't looked for a deal. Like I haven't gone out and done deal acquisition other than a coaching client or as a video project. I haven't done deal search in four years. I have averaged probably three properties a week in my inbox from someone that wants to sell them because of marketing I did from 2013 to 2019. I tried to stop my deal flow right after we bought this part because I said, I can't buy anything else. There comes a point where acquisition mode can turn off and you just have flow that continues to come mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. It's like the car How wash. many deals you get sent a day? 40, 50. Yeah. I, I mean, DMs, what I do with the people in my DMs is I tell them go work with my students because I don't want to do a deal with a non-student anymore. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm headed to with all my students. And you know, of course, it's a little different. We're going after laundromats and car washes, but just because people know I'm in that space, they're like, oh, come do a deal breakdown with me. I've got a car wash down the street for $40,000 that I can buy. It's an interesting world, like we've all said. There's 1. so many ways to make money. $1.3 million. $1.35. What's this uh. permanent building here? So that's the building that we were, but I know the buyers, so I think they're going to let me put a laundromat in there. <laughs> no. Yeah, so the goal- So you'll operate uh, that for them and get some cash. That's my goal, It's probably go in and split it on halves because they've got 50 people that work for them. I don't have 50 people that work for me. So they can go in and get these units redone. And because we operate our own EPA certified wastewater facility, I just can't put washers and dryers in every single unit here because it'll dump so much water yeah. in the plant, it'll flood it. But and if the, you do it here. If I do it here, everything's going to be five times more efficient than a household and then unit. And you got some cash flow coming in. I got some cash flow coming in. It's not going to be a huge thing. 500 bucks a month. No, I'll make more than that. I'll, yeah. I'll put in my pocket a thousand bucks a month. Okay. off a of mini laundromat here because then we're going to do vending the closest gas station just closed down so we're like two miles from food right now oh so it seems like most everything here i mean you said 60 percent is vacant are some of the units you bought in that big swath of the purchase are some of those rented out oh yeah the good ones the, the ones best ones were we started from the most the easiest to rent to the worst to rent Got it. so now we're now at a point where i've offered several of these on seller finance give me 2500 bucks and i want you to sign a one-year lease with me where i can re possess the trailer if you default on the payment. And then if you want to be your own landlord and sublease these out with owner qualifications, I'm willing to do that. And it's funny to me, I've had several big investors call me for their kids or their nieces or nephews and say, Brandon, I heard you're okay with some subleasing oh, yeah, of the park. Dude. Can I be the signer on that account? Cause I want my kids to be able to get into some rental properties. Yeah, that's great. If this park didn't sell, I still have to come up with a plan to you climb out of yeah. With my manager, as awesome as she is, she was getting the park turned around. It's just that this guy came in and he said, what's the park worth to you? And I said, well, you have one of those funny spitball conversations with people. And it's like, I have to have a million dollars. No ifs, ands, or buts. I have to get a million dollars off of it. Is All the work. floor falling out of this thing? This is one that's scheduled to just be pulled out of the park and trashed. It is not economically recoverable. There's five or six different trailers here that they just need to be trashed. And we were in the process of doing that. And then I got the offer in and we just froze it. It's funny because, you know, these mobile home parks, they're some of the most sought after investments out there and they're so hard yeah. to make work. It requires a very special person to be able to deal with a trailer park like this, or you buy at such high scale, you can get the numbers to work in a lot of scenarios. I'm convinced, because I've talked to a couple guys that run these larger pseudo PE firms. They, they present themselves as like a private capital group or a PE firm or whatever. And you find it's just one guy that figured out how to do a syndication. And I've talked to a couple guys, because they said, oh, if you own a park, I would love to have lunch with you and do a brainstorming session. I am sitting at a table with you right now well how do you manage it how do you get your tenants to pay on time i'm like you just told some one of my friends you did a three million dollar syndication on a park that's smaller than mine they might have done a fund of funds where they raise money for somebody else's deal you know yeah well i don't know how they did it but i said why are you asking me how to manage a park and your deal size is three times higher and i said you're not getting any rent you're gonna go bankrupt aren't you they won't answer me of course but i feel like there's going to be a lot of parks like this one that'll be coming up in the future state of ohio is one of the few states in the united states where if there is a navigable body of water you own it i know for a fact out west you cannot own waterways now, let's imagine this was much, much bigger than it actually, oh, why is there so many bricks? Kid, this is the kids, the kids going yeah. and pulling them and yeah. throwing them Smashing. in. Smashing. If this was 20 feet wide, full of water, you own the dirt. The state of Ohio considers the water navigable, so the water is a public asset. The dirt is not. So you own the dirt. People are allowed to go down your creek 
or your river, but they step foot on land, it's not theirs, it's yours, and you can trespass them. So it creates a really interesting situation where riverfront or creekfront property in Ohio is very, very valuable because to an extent, the state of Ohio can't stop you from building your own dock. You're digging into your own ground. So, I mean, there's some stipulations, but there's guys up in Columbus on the Scioto River, which is the major waterway in Columbus, they have private boat docks within half a mile or a mile of where you guys are staying. If, wow. I, if you stay where I think you are, you're close to the Scioto Mile and there are guys with boat docks in their backyard. If you're doing kayaking now and you can get in downtown Columbus and you can kayak down the river for, you know, five miles or 10 miles or whatever. So this guy's buying it for 1.3 mil. Mm -hmm. He's going to go deploy probably another 700 grand. Yeah, I was going to say 700. He's going to be all into this 2 million. 2 million. What's his top line. So he's going to be doing, he, he he gets good money off of his places. I don't understand where he's pulling. I think he's like 815, 800. He's at least 700 a month okay. on 48 trailers. So he's, his top line revenue is going to be a little, a hair over $30,000 a month. Okay. So $30,000 a month gross. It's not a phenomenal, phenomenal number. Well, the number for him is probably, all right, let me cash flow this for 12 months, wait for rates to go down, mm -hmm. pull out cash out of the deal. So I have less cash in the deal. Yeah. You sit on this thing for five years, he raises the rent maybe at least once. So yeah. now he's not 700, he's 775. Yeah. Now he's bringing in almost 40 grand yeah. on a 5% rate that's amortized 10 years or five years, let's say. And he could probably turn around no. and sell us for 2.5. He won't sell it. He'll get a 15 year note. The banks that would finance this park, they're not going to look at rent rolls because I have not found a single bank that will finance the value in any of these trailers whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It is truly on the dirt. So he'll be able to cash out refinance it in three years when rates go down, but he'll only pull a million dollars to, at best off of the park. So he's still going to have a decent bit of cash into this. But his statement to me is... Where else is he going to deploy the cash? He can't. Yeah. This is it. So that's where his mentality is. He's Just, a long-term guy. He's a member of the community. I know the guy. If I had something going on like this and this was my exit strategy, I would do exactly what you're doing and just go, let me purge my feeling about this property. Take my 200,000 plus the capital I have in the deal. Yeah. Let's go roll it into something else. And that's, let's tell the story. We made 200 grand on a horrible nightmare. You're doing exactly what I would be doing. But if I'm not caught with my pants down, you hold this for forever, which is probably what your strategy was. That was what the though. strategy was. It was never, it was to go in, run it for four or five years, cash out, refinance it at the best we could, pull out all the capital, deploy the capital on something else. And to hold it for 20 more years. Yeah, to hold it for 20 more years. And it would have been a very, very competent play. But once again, 80-20 rule. This is 80% of my problems. Mm. Easy. 20% of my revenue inside the company. So <laughs> why keep it? So I've got a million in this. Unless I you got your ego tied in. That's, that's a problem too. Of course it is. Because it's me on the line. It's my personality. It's a Mr. Investment Joy who never loses money in real estate. I don't say that. People put well, me on this they pedestal. They see you on TikTok, they see you on Instagram, yeah. they assume you only win. The same thing here, same thing with him, is they assume you win in every little aspect of your life because you're only showing them on short clips. Yeah. Here's the little 90 second thing, so they assume you're winning everything. Plus, you talk about the opportunities, right? Yeah, if yeah. you're somebody yeah. wants to learn, it's like this is the opportunity to learn, not this is how I lost my ass. But you can share that on your channels to be transparent. So that's where I want to go to because when someone goes out and tries this for themselves, there is going to be a chance of failure. And especially early on as an investor, the chance of failure there's is going to be super high. And the, the reality is there's a 100% guarantee failure in some regard in every single deal, right? Mm -hmm. Failure to do this better, failure to... Yeah have oversight on the homes coming in, the failure to evict people before this happened or da, 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 whatever. There's always a, a thousand different failures, but you're walking out of this thing with not only a million dollar education, you have great stories to tell for the rest of your life. You gave some guy another opportunity. You're walking away with $200,000, you'll roll into something else. Like you won in a lot of ways. Yeah, because I do have a partner on the park and he has been the one to, to convince because I called back, I said, we bought this the same time as I bought a seven unit apartment complex and hotel. Crushing. Oh gosh, yes. And we're over here. Nickel and diming. People were threatened to kill me over this park. Like literally, it's that trailer right there, 41, where I pulled a gun on a guy. And I'm like, that's not worth my stress level in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people, they see all these units and they assume tons of cash flow. Or my first trailer park that I purchased, I'd rather have an RV park now because you've yeah. got people coming in and out. And yeah. they're usually high net worth individuals, high yeah. net higher worth. net worth individuals. For an RV, yes. And people are there for a happy thing yeah. rather than like, I'm here because I can't afford anything else. Yeah. And you get a, a ton of those people that are the same demographic in the same location. It's like just letting bugs go. Yeah. You know, I would rather own an RV park at this point, but when I first bought my first mobile home park, the one in Yuma, it looks just like my first road looks just like this, except they have no pavement. Every month we were putting about $2,000 in gravel into it and just kind of ding, 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 ding. It took four years for me to finally take a check. Yeah. Sounds about right.
Sounds right. Yeah. But if somebody told me that up front, I would have been like, wait, four years? I could have deployed that somewhere else. Yes. How do you know the stove is hot unless you touch the yeah. stove? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard lesson. And it's like, I very rarely lose on my real estate deals. So this one's like, oh, it's a real estate deal, but bigger. It's not a real estate deal. <laughs> It's a societal it's a, it's deal. A, yeah, it's a societal deal. It's a traveling circus. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Oh my gosh, the individual stories of every single Each person that was in here, I know, right? Oh, it's oh insane. I'm wondering, is this hail damage or did somebody like- It has to be rocks throwing against- Rocks or BBs or what? Yeah, what, what is like that? It's like kids throwing handfuls of rocks. I, it has to be, right? I guess hail could have gone sideways. Kids are getting bored and their parents are terrible, so. You have internet ran to all these? Like they all have- Generally speaking, yeah. Okay, they have a like coax cable or something? Yes, okay. yeah. It's the modern coax. So. I mean, you can get gigabit speeds in any of these trailers. I could turn it into a tech park. Wow. Hire a bunch of video editors. Mine Bitcoin. Idea. If you could have gone back in a time machine on this, let's say that $700,000 you've deployed yeah. cash wise, could you have completed the tiny homes with that same amount of cash? Guarantee it 100%. Because yeah. I can show you a park in Circleville. There's, they've deployed about half a million dollars. Because the State Home Mobile Home Commission, they're almost at a point where they want to see people do tiny homes instead of trailers like yeah. this. Yeah, they're more sustainable. Yes. And they're Higher, not falling apart. So, all that stuff. yeah. I never knew as a kid growing up in the middle of a cornfield, I never knew any drug addicts. We had one neighbor off in the distance that was a drug addict they're the only person that i've ever personally known that's ever overdosed and it was in that trailer park in circleville that they are now turning into a high tiny home community you know i've been saying dozer one side to the other doze everything into the creek which of course would be illegal but in my dreams i could do it yeah that's what they did they took in big excavators they ripped out every single trailer took down every home bare to the dirt bulldozed it all re-put in utilities roads or gravel everything and you look at that and you're like oh that's going to be amazing when it's done mm. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's so cool. So I've got a second park in Yuma. It's a smaller one, it's 18 units. So I've got an 85 and an 18. Okay. The same seller, seller finance, great rate, 30 year, you know, 20 years, 0% interest. My payment's phenomenal, everything's phenomenal. But the 18 unit is just like, it's so bad. I wonder if I just go in there and I go, all right, I'm gonna start with one. I take one out, tiny home, see what it costs me. I go, okay, I'm all into this tiny home, rerunning, new gravel, maybe even pour a pad of concrete. Yeah. Well, I would have to for the tiny home. I'd probably have to put yeah. a foundation. Unlike these, you just throw them on gravel. Yeah. If I see what it costs, if I can get into a tiny home for 40 grand, maybe I just yeah. go through and just redo the whole thing. So what's crazy to me is there's a tiny home facility, tiny home area here in Lancaster, Ohio. So that's 45 minutes the wrong way from where you guys are headed. And it's a tiny home facility. They've been there for over hundred years. What? hundred years, tiny homes. No one in this whole area, it's like 25 acres, let's say. No one owns the dirt, but they own the house. None of the houses are on permanent so foundations. they're just renting the dirt. They're renting the dirt for 300 bucks a month. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And they have for a hundred plus years. And you look at well, what facilities do they like? What do they have? Well, they have their own little movie theater. They have in-ground swimming pool. Like they have all these amenities because from the operation side, I'm looking at these. I'm like, the owner is cash flowing $150 per lot in this facility. $150 is set aside for user amenities. Whatever the people want is whatever the people get at $150 per unit. It's like 400 houses there. Yeah. So you think 60 grand a month can be deployed in upgrades and making this place nice the houses are depreciating assets they sell for eighty thousand dollars a piece tiny homes tiny home built in 1900 really and it's like no some of those people have them as vacation homes some of them are permanent residents and it's it's a system that's worked hmm. and i look at that and i'm like that's what i need because those are decent looking houses. They're not trailers with tin can siding. Interesting. Maybe the guy that's buying this, does he know what he's getting into? Oh yeah, he absolutely knows. The guy that's buying it is buddies with the friend owner that flipped this to me. Sub owner that was in here for a year. He bought it off the lady in Oregon. know each other out here in Ohio. Yeah, everybody's related, so. I've never been to Ohio. So I just thought it's gonna be no population. Nobody's out here. Cornfields, nothing. Then you fly and you're like, okay, this is pretty big. There's a town everywhere, by the way. Yeah. Everything's connected. It's not like we're just driving. In Arizona, you'll drive three hours without oh, seeing yeah. a single thing. I mean, and there's there, so many like big cities here. I mean, town, 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 Cincinnati, town. Yeah. Cleveland, the, Columbus. The, the population density in Ohio is wild. Because I was friends with a guy from Oklahoma. He's like, I would kill to live in Ohio. I was like, really? Because no one wants to live here. He said, your population density is so good. I could take my business, package it up, be in a more rural area than you are and just crush it. Cause he was two miles outside of Oklahoma city. He's like, Brandon, no one lives here. I bought my facility cause I could get a hundred acres for, a, he's in the paintball business. He's like, I had to get a hundred acres and I had to go two hours outside Oklahoma city. No one lives here. He said, every one of my customers drives two hours away. And he said, I saw where you live in Circleville, Brandon. You could get acreage. It's going to cost you double. But he said in your area within 20 miles of where you live, there's 70,000 people. 
people. And 20 miles of where I live, there's 3,000 people. And I'm like, oh gosh, I guess I do have it pretty good here. You do have it pretty good here. I mean, it, Arizona is very opposite of here where you guys are driving from Columbus all the way down here. There's not a place where the, the town is not connected in some way. Yeah. Right. It's like a vein. Arizona, you go outside of our town. Done, dead. Nothing. Yeah. Literally two, three hours, you could drive straight in Arizona and not see a single house, yeah. a gas station, you know, whatever. That's not how it is here. That's why I like it. We got all these small little towns. And the thing is, every one of these little towns, you can make money in some way. You can buy an apartment complex. You can buy the gas station. You can buy the trailer park or the car wash or whatever. Or finance. Yeah. Like you could just come in and go, all right, I have nothing. I'm just going to start in Ohio. Yeah. In 30 days, yeah. I own a laundromat, a gas station. I, I think so because what's happened is it's a societal problem in Ohio like it is with a lot of the Midwest. The people that started the businesses, they did well for themselves. They shipped their kids off to college out of state or the nice one, which is OSU, and they don't want to go back home. They want to go somewhere else where the opportunities are. So now dad's gas station that's doing a million dollars top line revenue right. a year, Nobody's 250 k a year net, no one wants to run it. Hey, Brandon, you want to buy this on Seller Finance? Yeah. yeah. I almost bought a gas station with a bar, with a restaurant, with a pizza store, with some rentals on Seller Finance. I was looking at that and my laundromat. And the reason I got the laundromat was the laundromat was $85,000. The gas station was $2 million seller financed. And I was just like, am I ready for the gas station? But if I would have bought the gas station, I would have bought this. It would never happen. This needed to happen. It did. The gas station now is probably doing $4 million a year and probably half a million dollars a year now.